Wouldn't it be cool if you could take a photograph and animate it to make it look as if it was a video file? Well, that's what you're going to learn today. We'll take an image into Cinema 4D and construct a 3D scene around it. Then we'll project the same image onto that scene so that we can fly a camera through it. So we'll talk about camera projection methods, we'll talk about reconstruction, we'll talk about materials, lights, and so much more. If you want to learn how to animate a photograph and bring it to life, this one's for you. Now here we are in cinema and the first thing we want to do is to go and add a camera through which we can project our image. So let me do that. I'll just go and create a camera. And then the trick here that's going to sell the entire shot is to add a tag to the camera called the camera calibration or the camera calibrator tag. I'm going to go and right click on this and then come down to the tracker tags and add the camera calibrator tag. As soon as we have this tag added, we go to the image tab and then we load an image that we want to use as our backdrop. So I'm going to go and click on the three dots here. And then I'll go to the tunnel. This is the image I want to use. And I'll hit open. And now that we have the image, we can go and calibrate it. So most of these are quite self-explanatory. So I'm not going to go through these. But I do want to show you what's inside this calibrate tab. So let me click here. Now in order for cinema to understand the actual perspective of this image, where the X, Y and Z lines would actually be, we need to create what are called lines and grids. So, I'm going to start with a line, and as soon as I do, you see it just creates a simple line here. And the trick here is to go and set the line to go parallel to something that you know to be straight in the actual image. For example, I know that these lines here that go all the way to the end are straight lines. Also, these lines on the wall here are straight. Maybe I can find some lines here on the floor. Doesn't really matter, but you do need to find some straight lines for this to work. So I'm going to click on this end maybe. And let's say we want to use this line initially. So I'll click and drag this up there and you see a zoomed in version next to my cursor. So I'm going to place this one anywhere on this line here. So I'm going to click and drag this, let's say here, and it might help to find something that's an intersection. For example, here, you see the light shade here intersects the darker one. So maybe I can park this just where the two match or where the two line up there. And then this end has to follow the same line all the way as far as we can see it. So if I click and drag this that way, and now I'll just do this a bit more carefully. Let's say maybe here where the two meet, the light and the dark shades meet, there. And that's our first line. Now Cinema doesn't know what kind of axis this is. I mean, is it Z, is it Y, is it X? It doesn't know. But we do of course know that this is the Z axis, so this is the depth. In order to specify an axis, so we help Cinema understand where this line is actually going towards, we have to hold the Shift key down on the keyboard, and then click on this once, and it turns this line into a red line, telling it now that this is the X, which is not correct. We'll hold down Shift again and click once again. It's now green, so the Y arrow, again, not correct. Shift click once again, and now it's blue, meaning that this is the Z axis. Now, a single line like this, of course, won't be enough for Cinema to solve this uh, scene or the camera. So what I need to do is to create a couple more of these. I can either go back to here where it says add line and start all over again. And then maybe add one more to this side, maybe one to the floor and so on. Or I can simply command and drag this to one side. So I now have a copy of this Z line. And I can reposition these points now. So I can click here and then maybe drag this one to where uh, this light area meets this dark one say here, and then do the same, following the same wall again, here. So now I had a second Z as well. Now you can create as many of these as you like, and the more of these lines you have, the more accurate the final result's gonna be. So maybe let's say we create one more, or maybe two more, on the floor. So I'm gonna hold down Command, and then drag this down. Let's say here, I'm looking at this end here. Let's go and push this down. And then this end will be on one of these intersections, maybe here. This looks a little more kind of clear. And then push one here as well. And now the point at which Cinema says, okay, I get it now, I get what Z is. This on the right hand side where it says Z vanishing point will turn green. And our aim is to get all three, X, Y and Z, to turn green so that Cinema understands the actual setup of the scene. 
So Z is done. Let's go and add maybe a couple for the Y. So I'm going to go ahead and command drag one of these lines. It doesn't matter which one. And I'll just have this new line here. Now, first of all, to set this as the Y, I'm going to hold down shift and then click once, twice, three times. So it turns green now. So this is the Y axis. And now I have to find something that's going straight up. And luckily, all of these lines here are going straight up. So let's see if you can use one of these. Maybe I can use this one here. So I'm going to click and drag this here to start with. And then this end, maybe following the same line here. So I'm going to go down on the same line. I'm going to push this somewhere maybe here. It's a little faint to see, but around about here is still clear enough. So that's the first one. Again, Y isn't solved yet, so a single line won't be enough. So I'm going to command and drag this maybe to this side. And then maybe this one can go up to here, where the light shade meets the darker one. And then this one, I'll first bring this closer to the first one so I can actually see how far or how straight I should go. So this seems about right now. Let's go and follow the same line here, keeping an eye on the zoomed in version. So I'm staying on the same line. Let's say there maybe. And I let go. Now using the two green lines, Cinema manage to solve the Y as well. But it's not quite confident about the Y. That's what these colors mean. If the color here is green, that means it's quite confident. And it will tell you it's guess. So if on the right hand side, if it's a zero, that means it's 100% confident that the Z axis has been solved properly or the Z vanishing point has been solved properly. The higher the number gets, the less accurate or the less confident cinema is going to be when it comes to determining the Z vanishing point. For example, if I go and mess up one of these lines on the Z, you see now, because I kind of pushed it towards left a little bit, let me exaggerate this a little more. Cinema now says it's solved. It's not green, so it's not super confident. And it's kind of accuracy is going to be 0 0.014. So you want this number to be as close to zero as possible. If it's zero, it's great. If not, you want it to be as close to zero as possible. And you want it to be green as well. So yellow means you're kind of there, but not quite. So I'm going to undo this a couple of times to get the Z back. And now I want to add a couple more lines for the Y to see if you can get the Y turn green as well. So I'm going to select this. And then maybe command and drag this here, closer to us. And then I can use the edge of this line here. Say it goes from here, all the way down, let's say to here. You see now Y says it's solved and it's kind of confidence level. It's almost zero, so that's three decimal points after the first zero there. So let me just go back and maybe add one more. So let me just command and drag this here. And then push this one down a little maybe. And then this one maybe here. And that looks like I got lucky there. So the Y vanishing point is also now zero. So that's great. And as long as you have two vanishing points, in this case, the Z and the Y, the third one is automatically going to be solved indirectly, meaning that cinema is smart enough to understand where the third line, the third axis would go. So that's what this indirectly solved means. Now, based on these lines, cinema also solves the focal length of the camera. So it guesses that the focal length is in this case, 56 millimeters which is about right actually for this shot. And it also solves the orientation of the camera. So where is the camera pointing towards? So that's also solved as well. And it's pointing towards this plus, which is the vanishing point for the Z. So that's also correct. The only thing it doesn't quite know yet is the actual position of the camera. So let's give it a hand as well and help it with the uh, position as well. So for that, I'm going to add a grid. So if I go and click on this add grid button, that's going to create this grid. And this is going to be our floor usually. You could use this as the floor, maybe the sidewall, the ceiling, but it makes things easier if you use this as the floor. But really, any flat surface will do. In this case, I'm just going to use this as the floor. So I'm going to click here and then maybe push this to that corner. And then click on this point here and then push it to this corner. And then this one here goes down to here. And then this one comes here. Now, in order to be a bit more precise with this, I can actually make use of these lines here. You see these lines kind of diminish as they go into the horizon there. So if I click and drag this up to that line there, and then this line can be here now. And then the same with this, I'll click and drag this up here. And then this one will line up again, just to that corner. It looks like this is a little wonky. So I may have made a mistake with this last one. So I'm going to push this down just a tiny bit. 
like that. But I actually want the floor now to start from this dark shade, not the top here. So I'm going to push this down a little bit to here and then push this down a little bit to here. You can make further changes by clicking and then dragging these lines as well, like that. Now, if you want to specify the grid to be a plane, let's say the X and Z plane or the Z and Y plane, in this case, it would be X and Z. You could hold down Shift and click on the grid as well, and that would change color. But since we've already established the vanishing points by using lines, we don't need that. But had we not sold the vanishing points by using the lines, we could hold down Shift and click on this to specify that this would be, in this case, the X and Z plane. But like I said, we don't need to do it now. Now that we have the grid, the final thing we need to do is to go and add a pin so it knows where the camera is and where the center of the objects are going to be as well. So for that, I'm going to go and click on this Add Pin button. And now this yellow thing here called the pin gets created. You can now click and drag this anywhere you like. And this will determine where the center of the objects are going to be. Now this will snap either to one of the corners of this grid. That's another reason why we actually create the grid like that. Or here. Or you can actually snap this to one of the points of these lines as well. So if you want the center point to be, let's say, here, you click and drag, and you see it snaps there. And if I just leave it as it is, if I just then go and create an object, like a cube or a sphere or anything, this is where the object is going to go to. Now let me undo that. And I actually want the object to be, let's say, here. So let's say this is the origin point I want the object to have. And once we have that, you see the position of the camera is also solved, so it assumes the distance of the camera but it's not red anymore, so that's fine. And one more thing I want to show you is if you actually shot this photograph yourself and you know the actual dimensions, for example, you know how high this line should be, you can actually click on the line and there's an option here, it says known length. And if you turn this on, you can specify how tall this line was in the first place. And based on that, it will create a more accurate result. Now, I don't know how tall this was, so I'm going to leave this alone. But if you do know this height or maybe the distance from here to here, you can just select the line and then dial in the specific value here. I'm going to select this one and then turn off the known length because I don't know how tall this was. And with all of that done, we're now ready for the next step. That is to create a camera mapping tag. So I'm going to go and click on this button here. So what this does is to create a material. It calls it the name of the image, a tunnel, and it applies it to the camera. And this will be at the foundation of everything else we'll be doing after this point now. So this is quite an important tag. The next thing we need to do is to go and create a background object. So I can go and hit this background button. And this now creates a new tag. And it adds that one to the background. I'm just going to rename this first. So I'm going to press Command Z to undo this once. And this material, I'll call this one Camera Material. And when I click back on the tag and then create a background, this new one, I'll call this background. Because they look the same, I don't want to get confused. So I have two separate materials here. The background is applied to the background. Camera is applied to the camera. So let's have a look at how to create the geometry now to replicate or represent these actual walls and the corridor. So for that, I'm going to start with a plane. You see the plane's center is where the pin was dropped. So that's where the plane gets created. Now, just to make life easier, I'm going to clear this grid. So I'm going to go to filter and then turn off the work plane. Also, the line here, the horizon line, I don't need that for now. So I'm going to go to filter, turn off the horizon line. And maybe this line here as well. This is the world axis. Now that the plane is created here, if I push this along that axis, the Z axis, you see the plane kind of travels in the Z direction like that until the end of the corridor. So I'm going to center this like that. And I actually want to change the depth of the plane. So I'm going to select it. Go to object. And here, I'll lower the width down, and I'll increase the height, like that maybe. Now I can push this away from us a little more on the Z, but you see the green and the red arrows are kind of getting in the way. I can't quite click on this blue one. Well, I can go ahead and turn off the X and the Y, so regardless of where I click, it's only going to move in the Z direction. So that's great. And maybe I can push this down just a tiny bit so we can see those edges that we hid away now. So I'm going to click and push this down a little. Like that. And then maybe center this a little more. Like that. Now that we have our floor or the ground, let's see if we can create the rest of this corridor based on this single plane. 
So, I'm going to select the plane first, and then come down to the segments and lower these down to 1 and 1. Then I'll go ahead and make the plane editable, which will give me access to these lines. So if I switch to the lines mode here, I can select that line, and then shift select this one. Now I want to extrude these up, so it looks like the walls are going, the side walls are going up. So for that, I can just press D on the keyboard for the extrude tool, or right click, and choose extrude. Now, if you didn't want too much detail, for example, if you want to ignore the detail here between the floor and this little skirting here, what you could do is to just go and click and then drag this all the way up, like that. That's one way. But I actually do want this detail here, so I want this to be as detailed as possible. So what I'll do is to click and drag a little bit until I get to this line here. Let me undo and show you again. So I'm trying to get to this line here or this line, like that. And I also want this to be going outwards as well a little bit. Right now, the two polygons I just created go perpendicular to the floor. But if I get my scale tool and then scale these outwards a little, like that, this looks like now the edges here are protruding outwards, which is what we want. Next, I'm going to get my extrude tool again. And I want these now to go up until here or here. But if I click and try and extrude now, you see they're going to go towards the center like that. That's because I've actually changed the scale of these, and now these are pointing towards the center of the scene. So extruding doesn't work. I'm going to undo this first by pressing Command Z. Instead of extruding, I'm going to duplicate these lines by holding down Command and then dragging them up. So this will extrude them just upwards rather than in the direction of their normals. So that's how far I want to go. Now it looks like this isn't a perfectly symmetrical image. So you can see this line here is just ending up at the bottom of these shapes whereas this line is actually crossing over. But if that's bothering you, you can actually treat these separately. So I can select the line here only, and then maybe push this one just a tiny bit down, like that. And then this one can be now a little bit taller than this one, which is fine. And what I want to do now is to go back to my Move tool, select both of these with the Shift key, and I want to extrude them once again until here, until the end of these shapes here, these kind of mini pillars if you like. I'm going to command and drag this up just a tiny bit. And I also want to now extend or expand these or scale them outwards again. So I'm going to get my scale tool, that's T on the keyboard, and just push them out. You see I'm simply trying to recreate this room using simple geometry. Now I'm going to hold down command and then push this up again. So we get to this line here and that line here. Now command and drag again. But this time I'm going to scale these inwards because it looks like these walls are now actually coming towards the center of that ceiling. So first, command drag. And then get the scale tool. And then scale these inwards now. And then maybe I can push this down a little bit. Like that. Again, I'm just trying to match this perspective here. Now if you wanted to get this detail in as well, you'd need to add a couple of more segments there. So let me just show you that once again. So let me undo this a couple of times. Command drag, scale in, until we get to this first line here. Then command and drag again. And then maybe scale these outwards, like that. And get the move tool and command drag again. You see, I'm not going all the way to the edge now, because when I scale these in, it will look like it's going towards the edges as well. So I'm going to get my scale tool and push this in. You see what I mean? Like that. So when it folds in, if you like, that is going to look like it's getting closer to these edges as well anyway. Now that I'm looking at this, actually, it doesn't look like this section is right. So I'm let me undo this. Here. I'm going to command drag just a tiny bit. And then scale inwards. And then command drag again. And then scale this out. Maybe lift it up a little bit. And then command drag again. And then scale these in. So yes, I think I just missed one command drag there. So now this looks more like it. I'm going to command drag once more to get this last part, but I can see because this wasn't symmetrical, this isn't working quite nicely, so I'm going to get my selection tool, select this one, push this one in a little bit, so I can treat these slightly differently. And this one, let me see if that's correct. It seems like that was correct. 
I'm going to command and drag this one that way. Again, I'm going to scale these in towards the center in just a second. I select this, command and drag this one that way. Now select the two edges, get the scale tool, push these in. That looks about right. And now command and drag up until we get to that ceiling. And now, of course, I want to cover up the top part here as well. So I want to bridge the two edges here to create a single polygon at the top. That's quite straightforward. So I can go and right click and use my bridge tool and just go from this polygon to that polygon. And that's our ceiling. The only thing that's left to do is this backside here. We didn't create the backside. So let me just first come out of this camera to see what this looks like. You see, this is the room we just created. So it's an open corridor here. And I basically want to be able to close this hole here. And that's really straightforward. So I can go right click and then choose this tool here, the close polygon hole, and then simply go and click. And that closes that hole. Let me go back to our camera. So that's what we have here as well now. Now it looks like this section here can actually be a little closer to us. So let me come out of this camera again and fly around. So what I could do for that is to select all of these and then pull them towards the camera so there's no gap between the camera and the room. So I'm going to get my edges mode here and the selection tool. And in fact, I'm going to go and press UL to get my loop selection tool activated. And then just go and click on this to select these. Get the move tool. And all I have to do now is to push this towards the camera like that. So if I now go into the camera, you see there's no gap now between the camera and the corridor. So if I undo this a couple of times, this was before. If I redo, this is after. Right, now that we have the virtual room created, let's see how we can project the texture, the material here, onto this room. This is actually really straightforward. All I have to do is to take this texture from the camera, the one that I said at the beginning of this video was quite important, and drag it onto the plane. And just like that, we've now created ourselves this 3D room. Let me show you what we've actually ended up with. I'll go and come out of this camera. By the way, we can now think of this camera almost like a projector. So our image, the tunnel image, is being projected onto the surface of this geometry through the lens of this camera. Which means we can't move this camera or rotate it or delete it. So because I won't be touching this anymore, I'll just go and call this reference. Now what I can do is to fly in this room as if it's a 3D scene. So I can go all the way to the back side here. Now, because this image is quite a low res image, this was about 600 something kilobytes. I am getting some pixelization here. Now we can improve the quality of this a little bit. Let me just go and see how much we can improve this. So the texture here was called camera material. It's this one here. If I double click to open that up and then go to viewport. And here where it says texture preview size, if I increase this from 1024 to let's say no scaling, Let's go into the original size of the image, and this looks much sharper now. So look, this was before. Let me exaggerate this. Let's see if I go and lower this down to 512. This is how bad it looks, but it previews quicker. And if I go to no scaling, this is the actual size or the quality of the file. So if I now come out of this, now I can fly anywhere I like. I can look around. And it feels like we are in this 3D room. Now, the other great thing about this is that we can add more elements to it. So if I, for example, go to the content browser, and maybe let's just go and search for, let's say, a barricade. There's a few here. Let me just see if I can use this. All I have to do is to just go and double click on this. And that should be added now to the scene where the pin was, which was somewhere down here. So let me just zoom back out. That's the one. Let me now go to my model tool. Now push this back and I'm going to scale it down. Maybe bring this closer to us, rotate it maybe, and then maybe go here. And now it's going to be on the floor, no matter how far I push this in the Z. So I can maybe put one more with the command key there at the back. Maybe rotate this one that way a little bit like that. And now I can fly past these barricades as well. But of course, if I go and render this like that, 
Although it doesn't look too bad, it's not particularly interesting because the room and the barricades don't actually interact with each other in terms of textures or lighting. Now, in order to get the room to actually start lighting up the barricades as well, I can just go back here and then select our plane. Let me rename this to be room as well, or tunnel rather. And I can select its texture here. In fact, open that up here. And you see the texture is automatically added to the luminance channel here. So not the color channel, but the luminance. And there's a good reason for that. That's because we can now go and turn the global illumination on. So let me go to my render settings, command B, and then go to effect, turn on the global illumination, and then come out of this. And if I now go and do another render, you see now that the room is going to start lighting up everything else, in this case, the two barricades. Let's see what that looks like. And thanks to Global Illumination, the barricades are now being lit with the same color scheme as this tunnel. But there are a few issues still. Firstly, I actually have these lights, which I quite like, but these are just the image lights. These aren't actual lights that are actually lighting up the scene. So let's see what we can do. Maybe we can add some cylinders here to represent these uh, fluorescent light bulbs or the tubes, and they can start lighting up the scene as well. And then we can turn the shadows on as well. So right now, you see, these still look like they're floating. The reason why there are no shadows here is because the plane, the floor here, is actually made of the luminance channel and objects with the luminance channel turned on can't receive shadows. But there's a way of fixing that as well. So let's see how we can do both. First of all, I'm going to go and add some lights. So I'm going to come out of this, actually just fly to a different angle as well. I'm actually done with this background image now, so I can actually turn this off or just delete this altogether. I'm just going to go and turn it off for now, so it doesn't get in the way. And I'll just go and create a cylinder. Again, that gets created where the pin was. I'll just change its orientation to Z. And then make this slightly thinner. And I'll try and place a few of these cylinders to where these tubes are. So I'm going to push this one here. Maybe lift it up. And then fly in. I'll just go like that. Let me make this a little taller. Thinner as well. Let's say here. And then... That's the first one. I'll do one more. So command, drag it here. That's the second one. Command and drag it here. That's the third one. Command and drag. That's the fourth one. And the final one, command and drag. So now I have all of these cylinders. They will act like the lights. I can now select all of these cylinders. Put them in a null. So that's Alt G. And then call this one lights. Now I can select the light. Let me see if they actually come down. They do. And I do want to see them a little bit inside the room as well like this. I'm just going to push this down. That's great. And now I'm going to create a new material. Call this one lights. And apply this to the lights now. Like that. And then on this one I'll turn on the luminance channel. So I'll select this. Go to basic. Turn on luminance, so they turn white like this. And now these will be calculated in the global illumination. So if I place an object directly underneath these, the object will actually be lit because of these lights now as well. But I don't want the lights to actually be visible in the final render because I already have the image of those lights anyway. So I'm going to go and add to it a compositing tag. So I'll right click and then come down to render tags and compositing. And I'll tell these lights not to be seen by the camera. So when I render, They'll actually be there as far as the global illumination is concerned because they will be now calculated or seen by the global illumination, but they won't be visible to the camera. And the final thing I want to do is to go and add the ambient occlusion as well. So let me just go to a different angle. Let's go and maybe add one more thing here. So I'm just going to go and add some text. And I'll now fly back to see the text here. I'll make this smaller, of course. Push this back. Maybe bring it here. And I'll just go and push this further back. Make it even smaller, like that. Maybe rotate it a little. Now maybe this would look nicer if this was sitting on top of one of these barricades, actually. So I'm going to take this more text, put this inside the barricade, then reset the PSR, so it goes exactly where the barricade is, and then lift it up. 
and then let me just zoom in and then we push this here and smaller and I'll just try and adjust the position of this a bit better now and push it down say about there of course it's taking the same texture as the barricade which I don't want now so I'm going to push this back out I'm going to set the font to be something different let's say maybe we use the typograph I quite like this font and I'll also add some caps to it some fillet caps so I'll just go ahead and turn the rounding up let's say there Like that and finally add a material to it there we go and I'll push the barricade and the text further back in Z space so I'll turn these X and Y options off and I'll push them back in Z like that and let's see what this looks like so I'm gonna go here to a different angle let's say there And I'll do a quick render now to see what the final result looks like. Now I think this is good, but a few things are missing. First, the shadows are still missing, so I need to go and add the shadows here. And secondly, I think it's a bit too dark. So the barricade and the text is a bit too dark compared to the rest of the room. So let's first fix the shadow issue. So I'm going to come out of this and then go to my render settings and I'll add and ambient occlusion as well to it. I'll come out of this again and do one more render. Let's see what this looks like now with the shadows. So the ambient occlusion is going to create the contact shadows here for us. There is an alternative to this. We could create what's called a shadow catcher and get the same result as well with the shadow catcher. But ambient occlusion is quite straightforward and easy enough to use. So this is before now. Let's have a look at what the previous one was like. Let me bring this to the center. So this is before and this is after. So we get all of these contact shadows now, which kind of sells the entire shot. But an issue we can see here now is that these lights are calculated as part of the ambient occlusion. So I don't want that. Let me show you the before and after again. So that's before. Everything else, including the text here and these barricades, look perfect in terms of the shadow or the contact shadows. But the fact that these lights are being calculated for the ambient occlusion is actually something that we need to fix. So let me come out of this. And you can go to the compositing tag of the lights and then tell them not to be seen by the ambient occlusion. And we'll try rendering this again. This should make the top lights disappear from the ambient occlusion calculations, and indeed they do, but they are still being used as light sources, which is great. Now, if I want the entire thing to be a little brighter, I can come out of this, go to the texture that we've used for the tunnel, it's this one here, open that up, go to illumination, I can turn on this polygon light option, this will tell Cinema that these polygons are actually going to be used as light sources, so it will optimize it. And I can go and increase the strength as well of the global illumination that's being generated. So if I go and, let's say, set this to 250%, it's now going to be two and a half times brighter than it was before. I'll also go to my render settings, and then global illumination, and then get the secondary method also to be radiance cache, so the light bounces more than once. And I'll increase the diffuse depth all the way up to 8. And then close this again and render it once again to see what this looks like. And this is the final render. You can see it's much easier to read the text now because it's much brighter. But you can see not much has happened to the barricades. That's probably because that the texture that's being used for this barricade is made of a reflectance channel rather than the color channel. Let me actually see if that's the case. So I'm going to go to the concrete material here. And indeed, you can see that this is made of the reflectance channel. So if I go in here, this is just using a Lambertian diffuse reflection layer. So that's the reason why it doesn't get affected by this global illumination change. But if I go to the color channel, turn this on, it's got the same texture. And if I turn off the reflectance and then come out of this. And now if I render this by pressing Shift R, let's see what this looks like. And now you can actually see that the barricades are receiving most of that light as well. So this was before, and this is after. And you can see it looks much cleaner, and actually took about half the duration as well. So the first one took about 5 minutes to render, 
and this latest one, without the reflectance but with the color channel, took about two and a half minutes. So this is before, and this is after. And all in all, this was before, and this is after. And that's it. If you now wanted to animate a camera through it, all you had to do is to go and create one. Let's say if I go now and create a camera here, like that, go into the camera, go to the beginning, select the coordinates of the camera, and keyframe these, and then maybe the rotations as well. Then go forward, and then push the camera in. Maybe come up here, and then keyframe again. Let me go back and play. And that's what we have. As a final touch, let's go and add some shake to the camera. So I'm going to go right click on this, animation tags, vibrate. I'll go and enable the rotation and then maybe set this to three degrees on all axes. And then the frequency will be, let's say, 0.2. Let's see what that looks like. There's a bit of a handheld feel there as well now. And that's it. That's how you take a photograph and turn it into a 3D scene. Before you go, if you want to win a free, live and fully interactive course, you can enter our weekly prize draw, where you can win a five-day course normally worth over $1,000. All you have to do is to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon here and cross your fingers. So don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you on the next one.